Thanks everyone for joining and for staying to almost the end of the Open Source Summit, <laughs> so one of the last sessions. And uh, yeah, uh, it's about Project Sunset, so uh, what a good uh, ending <laughs> or close to the ending uh, of the OSPOCON sessions. Uh, and what I am will be telling about, my name is Stefka Dimitrova, I'm a senior program uh, manager in the uh, OSPO within VMware. So I'll be uh, giving some steps and some hints on how to sunset open source projects and what I've learned. I learned actually many things uh, in this open source summit. I hope you all can <laughs> uh, can confirm that. Uh, but I've been reminded to not use so to be careful by using words simple, especially when I give some guidelines or instructions, because what's simple now to me after doing that for three years or more, uh, driving that program uh, that I called Kitty Orders of about sunsetting or unhiving inactive projects might be or not be so simple for anyone else who is new to the topic. So I'll start with quick introduction about myself. I already mentioned my position and ro my role within VMware, where I'm part of the open source community strategy team. And Dawn Foster here is my manager, uh, I'm, uh, which I'm really happy with. And uh, actually, uh, I have a financial and business background, although I'm already for 10 plus or minus years into the software development uh, industry. Uh, I tend to still think in terms of costs and benefits. So you can see why this topic is so important also for me to, uh, to be clear about what to, uh, what to archive or what to keep active. And I have also many other passions like uh, uh, climbing, mountaineering, uh, experiential education, working with kids on different topics. And after all, I need to balance it all. So that's why I like really to keep things simple. And that's also the only way for me in some case to, uh, to keep doing what I love doing. So the agenda is actually the steps that I'm, uh, I will uh, guide you through, uh, which is uh, I've developed through uh, yeah, developing the program and then experimenting, adapting, uh, which are, yeah, of course, start with know why you need a sunsetting process or why you need to duplicate a project, then what you have. So no, it's not easy to understand always what you're starting with in terms of projects or who to contact, especially uh, within OSPO's context when we're dealing with more projects uh, or more or larger portfolios then the decision making point, uh, where, whether to do that, uh, who is depending on that, who needs to approve it, and communicate it all and do the actual archiving. Be prepared to an archive. Uh, and all of this is actually the presentation, but why I need the other uh, 35 minutes. Uh, it's because like with every beautiful sunset, it's usually before and after a storm that's coming around. So you might expect things to go wrong or on the way. And as I've experienced that, I can just share some of the learnings that I have. So starting with uh, the why should we, should we be proactively uh, checking on inactive projects? And by we, I mean uh, either OSPOs. So just checking who is a member of an open source program office here in the room. Uh, yeah, okay. And then if not in a program office, maybe working for more than one project or interested in more than one project, then this, this makes it monitoring and looking into the uh, activity of open source projects a bit harder. Uh, when you're not uh, responsible for only a single one. So being proactive is also because what I've found out, not only based on experience within the company, but also researching some more information and uh, or simply looking into GitHub data. And I invite you to do that for every project that you're interested in or every organization that you're interested in. Just check how long projects uh, remain active after they're newly created. And uh, by looking into 8,000 plus repositories in some major 
companies in, within open source, you can easily find out, looking at the last commit date or the push out date, that 16% of them wouldn't be active. I don't say they are abundant because, yeah, that's further investigation needed to really confirm whether they're abundant or not, but they wouldn't be so active within after 12 months. And this trend continues, and just over the first five years, you see then 10 more percent will not be active, then nine more percent. So in the fifth year, half of the projects that are, have been started will mean, remain uh, to be actively maintained. Uh, contri there, there will be still contributors to that. So what does it mean is that if we are not prepared for that, and if we are working with a larger portfolio of projects, uh, soon we might end up with not really knowing what we, uh, what we need to prioritize and what not. And I was, as I said, I learned a lot during this week and uh, I hope we all did, but I was also inspired uh, heavily, uh, uh, like looking through the world of open source, um, uh, open source uh, Europe data. And I must admit, I've not read it through because, uh, yeah, uh, hanging out with colleagues and, and with people I met here was a bit more important for me this week. But uh, checking on the data of the research, it was uh, really obvious that uh, with uh, in larger companies, with increase of the size of the companies, at first um, the freedom and the encouragement to contribute openly. Uh, goes down, but then it increases again with uh, the um, 10,000 plus employees. And it's, uh, or that's my interpretation, interpretation again, it's mostly because of, uh, and that's also what I've heard in the presentations about this, this uh, uh, research, it's because of the clarity of policy. So at first no policy is needed, then uh, the lack of policy uh, gives people a bit of uncertainty whether they, they can or cannot contribute. And then with the larger uh, companies, there is again uh, the need of policies and the need of OSPOs. So I, I could really relate that to the, to the fact that within the larger companies, 10,000 plus, which is also shown in the research, uh, there is higher uh, possibility uh, or higher needs to have OSPO or um, a dedicated person with open source contribution. So what I conclude out of that is in a way this uh, circle. So more freedom to contribute uh, is of course related to more creativity, more source, more, more projects. Uh, but this then um, uh, drives the need to prioritize these projects and then be able to have better clarity uh, and uh, better policies. And I relate that to the uh, sunsetting of projects again by, by uh, being actively uh, in uh, developing more and contributing more and open sourcing more. At some point, we really need to have a clear policy of uh, uh, how also we are doing that in terms of how we will manage it and whether we will sunset some of it or not. Uh, and uh, and here to know why it's also important, especially if you are like me, are the person who needs to convince others that they need to, uh, to consider deprecating some of their work. And it's hard conversation sometimes because it's a work that uh, someone might be emotionally attached to. Uh, so knowing why and the benefits behind and being able to justify, of course, adapt the reasons because at first when I started this, this program, I thought uh, that it will be uh, a great uh, source of uh, knowledge base to prevent deprecating projects. But after all, not everything can be prevented and it shouldn't be because uh, this part of innovation that companies allow their employees or that, or that individual contributors to experiment more and not everything will eventually succeed or become adopted. So, uh, having some of the projects being archived is just part of the life cycle and knowing that we will be more, um, yeah, less attached to having that necessary uh, remain active. So one of the re uh, other reasons may be just uh, 
uh, reducing costs, of course, and uh, maintaining, but also uh, cleaning up space. And by that, I don't mean only like the space which in GitHub or space uh, as, as uh, something material, but also space uh, uh, in terms of having uh, time <laughs> to consider some alternatives uh, and uh, don't have the stress uh, or space in the to-do list can be as well. So uh, now when you're certain why uh, you start to approach on some setting a project, it's, uh, it's tricky sometimes and it's again most for OSPOs uh, or for pro pro uh, people dealing with many projects to know so where to start with. So which are the projects that might be potentially inactive or I call them sometimes uh, uh, archive candidates uh, and who to contact for in the different cases. And uh, yeah, and actually uh, the picture might be pretty complex, but what can help you to identify the potentially inactive repositories uh, would be just sorting them out at first. And that can be as simple as, uh, especially if you have a, a large amount of um, repositories, like. Uh, hundreds or thousands of repositories that you're responsible for in any way, you can filter them out first by the last commit date or the push date, date uh, which is uh, information you can easily see in GitHub. Uh, then, uh, of course, that just shortens the list. Still, there is a lot of work to be done because that, that can't be the simple indicator. Uh, if the list is short enough to reach out to each of the projects individually, that's the best option. And that's sometimes always what I prefer to, because then in conversation with the teams, I not, don't not only understand the, the background of why, um, why certain projects doesn't have commits uh, in the past year or uh, what's, what the plans are, uh, where they're going, are they, do they need any assistant guidance from the uh, open source program office. Uh, but it also just speed up the process because everything else is kind of an investigation which, uh, which takes more time if I do it offline than with talking with people. But sometimes uh, there is a larger number of projects that, and then it's harder to really reserve the time to individually contact each uh, person. So uh, another filter would be checking on open PRs, uh, issues, security alerts, so anything that might be an indicator that uh, the team or the person who were working on that project were not actively, uh, or they don't have, they might not have the resources. So uh, that's actually the most common case from my observation and for mm, the research on uh, deprecated projects. And uh, I've talked about that on Open Source Summit, I think it was two years ago because it was virtual. Um, uh, that were some of the common reasons, so either lack of resources, lack of time, uh, shifting priorities, uh, but also it's just, just it doesn't, uh, hasn't been adopted. Uh, so uh, here it's the, uh, the link on the bottom uh, is actually the uh, script that uh, uh, Don has, uh, <laughs> has worked on as uh, uh, among many scripts, of course, one of them uh, are, were uh, again to just have some of this data at hand, especially when you're working with more projects. And I will reference to that also a minute later because it also helps when, when you're taking the decision of whether or not and checking on dependencies. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, actually the, uh, one of the next steps. But first, uh, if you have decided or you have a, a short list or one project that you know you need to archive or to replicate, next question would be uh, whether to keep that separate or not. So is it, is it enough to just click the button and say I have the project if that's on GitHub or GitLab or any other instances or is some more work uh, or preparation needed and again in uh, uh, our experience in my experience as I was working with more projects this was the better option was to keep 
things separate, keep active and active projects separate. And there might be various reasons to do so. Uh, some might be just costs because creating a new uh, GitHub organization that has no members and no, uh, uh, yeah, no activity there might be much more, um, yeah, cost efficient than uh, keeping all that on an older organization that can help you also f easier to sort out members that are no longer active or, and just, just help you deal with access to these repositories, although archiving in GitHub uh, actually gives on read on access to so that. Uh, that's pretty simple and doesn't break any links. Uh, but we decided to have, uh, and, uh, and I'm happy to, uh, that I went to that direction to create an organization that's called, in our case, VMware-Archive. Uh, and this is an also easier way to show to the community that this is um, an archived project. And this was uh, one of the goals that I might have not mentioned, but it's one of the main goals actually why, why you want to archive a project. It's not also only because uh, uh, you uh, don't have the resources or don't want to spend any resources on the project, but you need to want to be transparent to the community uh, around that. So it was on the slide, but I didn't mention, but it's a this transparency of what's active and what's inactive and, and making sure that the community uh, that will rely or might rely on that uh, project will know that you not have the resources to actively maintain it, which is uh, uh, the next point uh, before the decision is taken whether to archive it or not. <laughs> and this is the, um, uh, again, checking on, uh, and the, well, even in cases, where maintainers have confirmed uh, so happily or unhappily that they, uh, they would want to deprecate their projects. Have you experienced such cases? Uh, so who has, who has experienced such cases that need, needed to close, a, uh, to close up or deprecate a project that they've been actively working for some time on? Just curious, yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a well, uh, it's not an easy decision, but if, even if you've taken that decision, you can't always do it. Uh, actually, you need to check first who is depending on, on that project. And uh, yeah, some, uh, again, some of the easy ways to check is uh, contributors, users, forks. Criticality score, that's a Linux Foundation uh, score. So you can check it, uh, it helps a lot. It, it goes through all this uh, uh, and also other uh, indicators and can give you a score uh, showing uh, whether that's high. It's again, it's a probability that it's, it will be critical if you deprecate that project or not, uh, whether that project is critical for others. Uh, and uh, I'm again referencing to, um, <laughs> to, the rep to, to the repo and the scripts, just if you are interested to help you uh, check on certain repositories that are, you are interested in. And then, uh, yeah, depending on the organization, approval might not be needed or not. Uh, where you go to uh, the next step, which is, okay, I decided, I confirmed to deprecate a project. Uh, I have all the approvals if I need any, uh, for example, the chief open source officer in the company, if there is such a role or, or simply by the maintainer or the other maintainers or within the community. What, what I do next? Do I just archive it? Again, uh, it's not always the best option just because uh, uh, it's better to communicate it first with the community in a way, update readme. Reference to another project, if there is such a project that uh, you have moved on uh, that's doing similar uh, and that would be useful for the users uh, of your project. Just reference it. Uh, also use mailing links, Slack, Slack channels, uh, other media that would, uh, uh, would be relevant for your project. Update web pages and wikis where that project is mentioned. And this is important here to talk with uh, 
in companies again with branding marketing team because they will know best where uh, and in, for for more strategic larger projects in the companies there might be materials around that or uh, information spread around that they need to consider if that project is no longer active to not advertise it openly. Uh, and then we archive it, <laughs> uh, which is uh, probably the easiest steps. Uh, well, GitHub provides the option to archive for repository, I mentioned, and it becomes read-only access, so it takes care of the access uh, similarly in other. Uh, I would advise to create a separate space, to move it somewhere separate, and this is also in a way to, uh, to make sure that if you, and uh, again, I encourage you actively working into project health metrics, uh, monitoring the status of your active projects, then you shouldn't, uh, uh, have all this data for projects that are not active any longer. Uh, it just saves time. Uh, and, uh, and also security alerts or, or any other um, ways, or any, any other sh um, activities that actually take time <laughs> and take energy to monitor, you couldn't exclude all the unactive, archived, deprecated, or whatever you call it, projects from that activities, and this will save your energy for what's really prioritized for you. And as I mentioned, uh, having all this done, in some cases, you need to be prepared to undone it. And why to bother so much to do all the steps where you're allowing uh, the door to be opened back and uh, to revive the project? So at first it happens. So it might happen that you have missed an important dependency or that someone who is interested in that project want to pick them up and would, would be willing to revive it. So it's good to have a process that will follow you through the steps and say, uh, it will be similar to the process uh, if, uh, if you have some in mind about creating new projects, going through a compliance check, is license file there? Is it uh, uh, contributing, uh, contributing file? Is it up to date? Code of conduct, do you have any code of conduct? Do I need to work on something else? It's just similar checklist as if this is a completely new project because it might have been uh, archived for a long time. So there might have been things that have changed in between. And also again, check on security, check on any other issues. Make sure that when you're bringing it back to life, uh, it will be a good, pro healthy project. And the other reason to have such a process, uh, what I've uh, experienced it, that's sometimes the tipping point when I talked with, with a team uh, that's considering whether to, to archive or not. So they admit that they don't have the resources, they admit that they won't be working on that for probably in the next year even. But they hope someday they'll have the time. That's usually that hope that, uh, so I, uh, uh, yeah, if you are like me, I still have that pair of jeans that I keep that I <laughs> hope that I will wear someday, but it's still there and takes, takes place. So it's like similar hope that, okay, I will find the time and I work on that, or I will hire another engineer that will help me. And to be honest, uh, that has hardly ever happened to bring a project back, but giving that um, back door open and giving that promise uh, to myself also, because that's, I've, I've, I've tricked myself also when I want to clean up things in my life, in my work, uh, uh, so more work or uh, just in some other areas <laughs> that I'm interested in, uh, allows me to better take that decision. And yeah, and with uh, doing these steps, what you next do is repeat them. <laughs> uh, and that's, um, that's really important because it's not a uh, one-off activity. It's not like, okay, I do a cleanup and, uh, and I, I've, I also was um, 
naive enough when I first started the program to call it Git in order because I thought, okay, I will, I will put everything in order and that will stay in this way. Uh, but no, uh, I do that every quarter most, uh, mostly. Uh, of course, there is ad hoc uh, um, activities like merges, acquisitions, onboarding of teams, companies um, that would require this check, this just initial check. And when you do that initial work, it's always harder uh, uh, than when you do that follow up and only uh, only check on certain projects that you have highlighted maybe, uh, or you've talked with the teams and they said, well, maybe I'll come back to it, but I'll tell you uh, next quarter and then check with them again next quarter. So it's an iteration every time. So go back through, through the process, uh, uh, adapt some of it, of course, and um, yeah, and be uh, really be uh, be open to that conversation uh, of uh, costs and benefits. <laughs> I come back to the uh, yeah to the finance background, but it's again it costs not monetarily only, but in terms of time, energy spent, uh, just uh, again to the freedom to experiment with something new or to to. Uh, take more, um, yeah, to, to, to take uh, or to prioritize some of the other projects which, uh, which someone would expect that they will bring more value. And with that, I've actually, uh, yeah, I've repeated the steps. Uh, so I am actually open to any questions that you might have. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, aside that had the comment, and looking at the dates on the comments, um, is there like an acceptable range for when you can look at it and say that comment was too long ago, or what do you, I mean, how do you gauge that? Well, I've I've actually experimented around that. So at first, uh, I was considering having 18 months as like the date. Uh, so uh, if there was no commit, 18 months. So within 18 months, then probably it's an active. And then I started shortening the period because at first uh, uh, within these 18 months when I had the, like initial reviews, it was sometimes too long ago to find out who has, uh, uh, who has last work on the project. So I just out of experience learned that like 12 months, it's a better short frame. So like with 12 months, it's good to check. It's not, it doesn't mean that projects become inactive or are really inactive if they not have any. There are, there are many, many of libraries that are just stable, so you don't really need to do much work on them. If, uh, if teams work on the issues and the PRs, they don't really need to commit any code. But uh, with all this also security and other uh, versions, depend dependencies, updates, it's just a, a, like kind of a red lamp and it says, okay, check with that project. Uh, and yeah, and maybe I will shorten the time frame if I see that it's 12 months, it's a bit too long. It's also the way also the community develops and uh, um, yeah, how the projects work. But it's, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I just, Maybe it's hard to build the contributor comparing to the user of this project when they are, uh, because they would spend the time and the passion in it, but like this contributor have, uh, have enough passion to continue this project, but their uh, maybe programming skill is not enough. Maybe they just focus on the documentation part of work, but you, the who, uh, well, mainly control the program cannot continue it. Do you think what is the good way to do with that uh, contributor? Uh, so I forgot to repeat the question, but now I will try to <laughs> rephrase it. So the question is, where, uh, what is the best way to work with the contributor if the project, uh, if they probably don't have uh, the skill base, or there are some other reasons that they don't work on the project? No, is no, no. I mean that you don't have the time to work on the project and you want to archive it, 
but another contributor, they also have time to work on it, but they cannot take over your role because their uh, skill level or because they are not good at country, uh, not good at programming. They are doing the documentation work. Uh -huh. How can you uh, communicate with them? Yeah, th this uh, well, this uh, in the different projects and in different uh, communities is settled settled in different ways. So there are there are projects that they have uh, have worked on. The communities have worked on governance governance documents on how to uh, exactly for these cases how to onboard new people, how to teach them into maintain a role. Uh, in other projects, mostly when they're smaller or new and they've not considered that. Uh, then you can learn actually from other people's example and see and just develop and use some of these examples because uh, what I've seen is that uh, everyone is happy when they decide to give up the project for whatever reason, the maintainer or the originator or yeah, the current maintainer or the originator, that they don't have the resources to work on them. They're happy if anyone else is interested. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, it might not be always the case that they have the time to onboard that person, but they would at least be happy to, to start that conversation. And then it, it's individually to decide it. So, so I would encourage to, uh, for anyone in such a situation to reach out to the maintainers, say that they're interested, mm -hmm. and then they can negotiate in some time uh, to, uh, to, to work through that onboarding process. On the project, yeah, you want to ar archive it, and another person said they can take over it. But I see you mentioned about the um, unarchive process. So, uh, did you think that it's better for this person, uh, this person, to fork your project and start a new project, but uh, as a succeed to your project, or they just take over your role and continue your project? But maybe one day you want to uh, continue your project again. Well, this uh, again depends because in uh, in open source and in upstream philosophy, so forking it's not always the uh, the best option. So if they can come along and continue working, but if the company policy doesn't allow that uh, that external person is a maintainer of a project that's been originated by the company, forking might be the only option. Yeah, as as you mentioned, so. Again, <laughs> depends on the use okay. case. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think you had a question or? Uh, I, I did. I think it was similar. <laughs> I was, maybe there's a nuance here. I was going to ask if you ever run into the situation where um, the company, let's say VMware, decides we are no longer going to invest in this project, but you still have like some external community around mm -hmm. that project. Um, does that factor in, or uh, maybe like you said, maybe that's just a well you guys are going to have to fork? Well, know, that factors in a lot, and that's actually the step that I was uh, previously going through in the decision making whether to do that. So right. if it's, and that's also our role as an open source program office is also to to to, to help in these conversations mm -hmm. because it's not always everyone in the company understands the importance of a certain uh, piece of open source software. So then uh, program office is the supportive. Yeah, we, we need to help with that conversation and to, to make sure that uh, uh, yeah, this is really considered into the decision uh, yeah. whether to continue or not on a certain. Oh, that makes sense. Because yeah, I mean, you know, if, if the company is not going to invest in, you know, in, in maintaining it anymore, it's not a good look, right? To, mm -hmm.
Yeah, and I, I completely forget to repeat the questions, <laughs> but I, I would try to <laughs> I would try to summarize actually what Adam shared as an example was that uh, when uh, he started uh, Herald project as part of the uh, yeah as an open source project originated with the company, but uh, as he mentioned, it's. Uh, uh, not a project that uh, it's uh, like strategic in uh, terms of the uh, VMware strategy in terms of open source. It was also so he continues working on that. It was donated to um, to uh, to the foundation so uh, he could continue and he does really actively continue working uh, on the project as a VMware employee. So yeah, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's another case. So what uh, so what we actually also uh, well, it's it's different in each company. So I, I try to I would try to generalize because there will be different use cases. But in uh, uh, you might be uh, contributing to as part of being in the company, you might be contributing or someone might be contributing to a project in their personal time, but still needing some. Um, approval from the company to do that contribution and it's not only company policy it's sometimes country policy and through uh, country leg registration so that's that gets complicated when the work has started within the company and the company doesn't want to deprecate it then it's 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 always best to advise within the certain uh program office or whatever uh expert in that environment is uh, to, and as I said, it's always advised to, if there is the interest, to continue working on that project and to encourage a person to continue working that project. And, uh, and again, it's a conversation. Not all managers would understand if they don't have the OSPO or open source background. Uh, but yeah, you can work with some data and justification why that's important for the community and help them understand that it's uh, it's in the uh, uh, it's the win-win case. So <laughs> actually, we're looking for the win-win game in uh, in open source, but also in all business. Uh, well, that's the only game that it's, it's drives people forward. Any questions? I think we only have two minutes or one minute. <laughs> Three minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, if not, I really thank you all, and uh, I just uh, wanted to share by putting so much pictures of sunsets that I that mostly I did. Uh, well, actually, all of the pictures were mine that were with sunsets. Some of them had sunrises. So you can hardly tell what, what the sunset and what the sunrise is. And that's usually what happens with a beautiful sunset. We have then there is a beautiful sunrise. So we can't have the one without the other. So don't be afraid to close something that's not active uh, when you have the energy enthusiasm for something else. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. <laughs>